Hello everybody and welcome to another Hobby Cheating video. And as this is Hobby Cheating 150 in the regular series, uh, I thought it would be fun to do something uh, a little different. Rather than show a particular technique, I thought we'd walk through sort of a set of advice that I think I've built up over competing for the last three years and we'd talk about painting for competition. So uh, I started painting for competition about four years ago. And so what I share here is my own experiences and successes and foibles and such that I've had. Uh, but there's, I think, a lot to this. There's a lot of people who I think are interested in this, but it's tough when you start to know exactly what you should be doing and how you should be thinking about your miniatures. Often the idea of just like, that gets thrown around is just get good or practice, but that doesn't really tell you what you need to know. Uh, so this video is gonna explore from a lot of different angles, I think, Everything I would tell you if you came up to me and asked me, what should I do to paint for competition? So that's what we're going to talk about, and we are going to deep dive on this. So settle in, folks, because we got a lot to cover. We're going to go ahead and break it all down. All right, first up, we're going to start with a little disclaimer, and most of this should be obvious. This stuff is my opinions, all right? This isn't dictum. This isn't Bible truth. Um, everybody's got their own methods. Everybody's at their own point in their hobby journey. As I say here, the best thing you can ever do with yourself is be honest and just keep taking your next step. The last point's the most important. There is no silver bullet for winning awards at a painting competition. And painting competitions should not be thought of hegemonically. They are very different. Each one has its own character. There are different types, different, uh, different awards schemas, it's as many differences between them as there are painting competitions. So there is no one single strategy. Instead, what I'm going to offer here is a set of guidelines, things that I keep in mind when I paint for competition and I think would help you as well. Okay? So that out of the way and understanding that all of this is my opinion. <laughs> all right, so hopefully we've got that. Um, but I also hope that you can think of these as guidelines and maybe they can be helpful in your own painting development as you go toward painting for competition. So the first question you might ask is, well, why? Why would I compete? Why paint for competition? By the way, I'm going to show you photos throughout this. Like I just have, I have photos mixed into this. It's nothing more than visual interest on the screen. Sometimes I have a story related to it. Sometimes it's just, these are just minis I've painted for competition. So there you go. Uh, just so there's something to look at. Well, if you're looking at this, they're also just some of my favorite things. And it's always fun to share your favorite things. So, and that's number one, sharing your work, uh, sharing your work with other artists, with other people who are looking and, you know, at, if it's a, at a convention or something who are at the convention for other reasons, you never know who you're inspiring with your work. And that's pretty awesome. Uh, I love going to competitions to look at other people's miniatures. Most of the time I spend, you know, at, at, painting competitions is just sitting there staring at the case at other people's stuff, just being amazed by their work and really trying to drink it all in. Uh, it's so rare you get to see that much great work in one place. So I, I, I mean, I think it's something that you need to absolutely take advantage of when you've got it. Obviously, another big advantage is it pushes you to improve. You know, painting for competition forces you to think about things and take things to a higher standard than you otherwise would. So it can be beneficial just to your development as an artist. It can also let you explore new mediums, maybe things you wouldn't try, maybe scales of miniatures, maybe you paint your first bust for a competition, you know, all these sorts of things. Uh, the community. They're the Some of my best friends in the hobby are people I've met through painting competitions, other artists, people who inspired me, who I eventually got to talk to and learn from. And learning from is the next point, which is feedback, whether it's from other artists at the competition, from the judges, uh, or from somebody just casually observing. Uh, it, it's incredibly helpful. You don't see your own flaws as an artist, as a painter. And so having somebody, having other voices and other eyeballs look at them and give you feedback, even if it, you don't end up you know, acting on it, it's still useful because it gives you an outside perspective on your work. And finally, and you know, probably most importantly, it's really fun. Like I love miniature painting competitions. It's just super fun to participate in. So have some fun and, and grow all at the same time. What a deal. 
All right. So now we're going to get into the particulars of the advice and how I have framed this all out is sort of categorically. It's just the way my brain thinks about it. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is competition type. Uh, there are many different types of competitions and each has their own nuance. So the first obvious distinction is online versus physical in a world of digital media and, and social media platforms. There's a lot of online competitions now. Uh, Iron Painter uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the Evy Metal Facebook group runs a great competition. Miniature Monthly runs a great uh, painting competition. So there's, there's lots of different online competitions. And when you're painting for online, you need to realize that, one, there could very well be a much larger number of people participating than can physically show up in a venue. Two, you need to make sure that you take really, really good photos of your stuff. If you have an amazing painted miniature and you take bad photos of it, you will not win an online competition. It doesn't matter how objectively good you painted. No one else but you knows that. It sounds really obvious when you say it like that, but it's 100% true. So spend time on your photos. Make sure they are crisp, clean, great photos if they're going to be for an online competition. When you think about physical competitions, you need to think about things like, are, is what you're painting going to be able to be transported to the location that you want to take it to? Uh, I painted a competition Marathi earlier this year and realized that I had made her a quarter inch too tall for the case that I had that I could take on an airplane. So she didn't go to the competition. It's just that easy. Missed it by that much. And that's my own fault. But, yep, there you go. <laughs> it's just what happens. So, you know, and also if you're thinking about a physical competition, not only do you need to get your stuff there, but think about the practicalities of uh, what else that's going to mean for when you need to show up at the event. And, you know, when is the when is the turn in time? When is the pickup time? All that sorts of stuff. Right. So just think about, in other words, how it's going to require you to commit to the thing, whatever that commitment happens to be. Uh, the next big distinction is what I'll call top three versus open system. Uh, top three is your traditional sort of gold, silver, bronze. This is how like Golden Demon is run, for example, or Crystal Brush uh, versus open system, which as far as I know was originally uh, European sort of painting competitions, but has now migrated into the States and uh, a lot of different competitions use it. In top three, there are three awards per category. It's pretty obvious. There's a gold, a silver, and a bronze. Open system still often uses the gold, silver, and bronze terminology, but there's no limit to the number of those awards given out. Um, by the way, zero is one of the potential numbers given out. Uh, but they are it, open system. The idea is, well, okay. So top three, you look at all the the judges. Ideally, look at all the miniatures in a category and say, this is number one. This is number two. This is number three. Right. And as far as whatever their criteria is. Whereas in an open system, they look at the sweep of miniatures and then judge them against, you know, generally some objective standard or uh, sometimes the the best miniature there in the category is taken to be the highest standard. And then everything is ranked and scored according to that. Uh, there's a couple different ways to, to do it. Uh, but in, in all cases, you could have like one gold and seven silvers and two bronzes, and that could be perfectly valid. Or you could have four gold and zero silvers and two bronzes. That's a, you know, the point is, is that you're held against some kind of standard separate from just the miniatures present. Okay. Uh, open system is great because realistically, the only person you're competing against in an open system is yourself. Uh, so I, I personal opinion only, I tend to prefer them um, because you uh, you you really get the direct feedback of sort of where your work has fallen. And then if you come back to that competition next year, you can improve over your work and you, you have a very direct measure of that, right? With top three, it's easy. You know, if you're number four, you get nothing. Like being number four is great. You're the first loser. Um, but you don't necessarily even know that. And that can be a real challenge, right? Um, you could end up going to a competition a couple years in a row and be fourth place every time, but never know it. And you walk away with the same sort of award, quote unquote, that is to say nothing, as somebody who, you know, didn't get anything at all and was had maybe a, a very poor showing. Um, so 
there are, you know, obviously benefits. There's there's Bane and Boone to both. The point is simply be aware of it and what that means to, uh, you know, your expectations you set <laughs> around your performance. Okay. We'll talk about winning and losing in more detail later. Um, think about the size of the competition. What I mean by that is like if you're going to your local store and entering into a competition, realistically the – level of the competition is probably going to be lower than if you're going to uh, salute, right? Um, because there are going to be hundreds of entrants at the one and probably, by the way, some of the best artists in the world, whereas at your local store, I mean, unless you have a very interesting local store that, you know, truly incredible artists regularly attend, um, you're probably not going to see that same level of competition. That doesn't mean you should try any less. It just means you need to think about what that size of it is because the bigger and bigger and bigger events get, the more you're going to need to think about what are you doing for your piece and how deep are you going to go into it. Um, we'll, uh, and that's, again, we're going to talk about time a lot on a later slide. But just being aware of the size of the competition and, again, setting your expectations accordingly, thinking about sort of what, you know, what are the categories going to be filled out with, that kind of thing. It's useful to understand sort of the level that will be on there and on display. By the way, I'll, I'll guess I'll say this. This is my Angel Knight. Um, this, this, this guy is originally from Kabuki Miniatures. Um, just one of my favorite minis I've, I've done. I really love that dude. And so, yeah, he went to Crystal Brush a couple years back as well as some other competitions. Uh, the last and most important point is read the rules. I can't believe I have to state this one, but this is like, this is one of those things like when you were a kid in school and the, the your teacher would ha pass out a test and say, read the directions first. And then you'd see people take the test and not read the directions. And the directions said, don't fill out answers one through 59, only fill out answer 60, you know, or something like that. And you knew who didn't read the rules by who who filled out the whole thing. Um, read the rules. Understand the competitions. Understand how it's going to be judged. Understand what you can bring and can't bring. You know, all these kind of things. Are there size limitations? Are there basing limitations? Are there all make sure you understand what the rules are. Because, again, if you don't put the judges in a bad place, don't show up with an amazing miniature that's breaking some rule that they clearly laid out and then you put them in a really bad place, right? Where they now have to suddenly decide, do we disqualify this person because they didn't heed the rules we set down and be mean to a person who, you know, seemingly be mean, I'm making little finger air quotes, to a person who may have traveled and put in a lot of hours of work or do we make an exception and say, okay, in this case it's okay, but then what if somebody else breaks two rules and three rules, right? You, you don't put the judges in a bad place. By the way, that's not going to really help you when it comes to then them judging your work later. <laughs> if you made them give you some kind of, you know, exception because you didn't bother to read, that's not starting you off on a great foot. Okay. Competition bias. Uh, this is a fun one because this is something a lot of people don't like to think about, but I want to get you comfortable with it right out of the gate. Every competition has a bias. Full stop. Okay. I understand I didn't full stop on the screen. That's okay. It's not a bad thing. It's just a thing. Your art is not going to be judged by a computer. It is going to be judged by human beings. Those human beings have biases, whether they're subconscious or conscious, they exist. Certain competitions prefer certain styles, certain aesthetics, certain whatever. Understanding what that is and speaking openly to the judges about what they were looking for is your best chance to do better when you compete in the future. The best way to do well at a competition is to compete there multiple times. And, un and really think and take into account what the judges like at that particular thing. Now, the judges panel might rotate, but competitions, in my experience, tend to have broad expectations or, or ways that they operate or things that they like. That's okay. 
it's not bad. It's not, you cannot expect human beings who are judging to hold your art against some completely unbiased objective standard. This isn't the Supreme Court or whatever, and even they have, like, all of the discussion in civil society is about the bias of the Supreme Court, which is theoretically like the highest sort of neutral court in the land is what it's supposed to be. If they don't, if they're not unbiased, guess what? The judges at your miniature painting competition are. Okay. And that's all right. Just understand what it is and what it means and paint accordingly if you want to compete there. Doesn't mean you have to radically change your style because most of these are quite broad. Okay. Even, even sort of, um, brand specific paint competitions so stuff like uh lock and load or I, i've never been to lock and load but i've i've been to the uh, the p3 competition at gen con obviously uh and or or like golden demon or stuff like that uh even these kind of competitions don't it's it's not like they have some extremely specific thing like oh we only like this exact method of blending or this exact selection of color palettes or use of color theory or something i've i've never ever encountered anything that specific at a major competition okay but broadly certain competitions and certain you know sort of judges might be more accepting of certain things than others here's an easy example okay some competitions are far more subtractive than others based on flaws. And what I mean by that is, uh, let's say you left a, a mold line. Might be well hidden, might be very minor on your, your piece. You didn't notice it, and by the time you noticed it, it was too late, and so you leave it there. So some competitions are, well, well everybody's going to ding you for that. The judges will always notice. Rule number one, the judges will always notice. If you ever look at a competition miniature and think, oh, maybe the judges won't notice, you're wrong. They will every time, period. Okay? Assume they will, and 99% of the time you will be right. So let's say there's this minor mold line, right? Some competitions are quite subtractive for that. Having that thing will knock you down. It will hit you pretty hard because they see it as sort of like a you didn't do a basic thing that should have been done, right? And so it's highly subtractive. Some competitions are less so. They look at technical, you know, mistakes like that, and it's going to count against you, but it's much more minor. The, the holistic positives of your work are taken into far greater account, all right? That's a biasy. Uh, again, it doesn't mean that it can't be. It, it's not necessarily some bad or terrible thing, but it's a thing that you should understand, Okay. This is a controversial one, I know. And I know we'd all like it to think that we can just take it and paint towards some objective standard and that, that you know, a piece will, that wins at one competition would win at any competition, but it's just not true. Um, I have had pieces take best in show at one competition and not place in a, in a different one. It's just what happens. Okay? All right. Moving on. Less controversial. Category selection. Okay. First off, going along with reading the rules, understand the various categories and make sure whatever you're painting fits in them. Uh, and this is something people screw up so often because they will, you know, do the wrong scale of figure, or try to enter into the wrong category or whatever they happen to do. They'll not have enough models for their unit or uh, they'll, you know, whatever the case. Understand what the definition is of the category in question and make sure you're painting to that. Um, again, these are pretty loose guardrails. Like a, a category like unit at most competitions is, is pretty loose. Um, but, you know, you can't take a unit of Knight Titans and enter it into the unit category, a Golden Demon. <laughs> right? Like that's doesn't matter that within the scope of your army that might count as a quote unquote unit um they have rules against that about around the size of the individual figures that compose a unit right so but you probably could do something like that under the open category sure that'd be fine okay so read the rules understand the categories and make sure you what your painting fits in them uh the other thing I'll say is that in my experience, single figure standard size. So in other words, what's on the left here, that's Percival from Kingdom Death. 
uh, in my piece, Dreams of Avalon, which is, again, these, these are all just things I love um, that I've painted. They, um, this is going to be the toughest category. Like, basically anything single figure will usually be the toughest category, or it will have the most competition, which generally translates into the tougher categories. Not always. Uh, that's not, that is correlation, not causation. Okay. Um, but the point being is that you need to think about the categories you're entering into and what the competition is going to look like and understand that it's something like single figure because it requires painting one normal size figure is sort of the lowest barrier of entry for people to complete, right? Um, a unit is by its necessity a lot of figures. Large miniatures are by their necessity large and hence take a lot of time. So these categories tend to have less entrance because, you know, time is limited in life. So there you go. Uh, so understand that. Finally, if it's your first competition, think carefully about your categories, especially for stuff like diorama. Lots of miniature painting competitions have diorama categories. I would strongly ward you off of doing a diorama for your very first competition. I say that only because it is an incredibly complex category and it, it brings in a lot of different materials and techniques and compositional elements that you often don't run into with units or single figures or even large miniatures. Um, it's better to, I think, compete with other things first. Look at the dioramas that are there, understand them, study them, get get a little bit under your feet and then jump into it. Again, it's personal experience. If you if you have no expectation around winning and you just want to do a fun diorama to do a fun diorama and to get feedback, then okay, jump in. Just just make sure you're getting in there with both eyes open. That's why I don't say don't do it. I say think carefully about it. Okay? All right. Miniature selection. All right. This is a very important one and oft overlooked. Number one, most important. In fact, I think this is the single most important thing I will say in this video. If you remember nothing else, please remember this. Pick a miniature you are passionate about. Something you love. Capital L, capital O, capital V, capital E. Love. You are going to be spending an inordinate amount of time with this miniature. Between preparing it and painting it, and transporting it, you are going to be very familiar with this miniature by the time you're done. If you're picking something solely because you think it'll do well, it's not going to do well. You can see passion, okay? It comes out. Judges recognize it, I promise. Uh, what I have over here on the right is is, you know, Redemption, is my Redemption engine. This is a piece that I quite literally planned out for six months before I ever touched the miniature and then spent about 150 hours working on. This was something that was in my head often when I went to sleep at night and some of the first thing, and one of the first things I thought about when I woke up. I love this miniature, okay? Because I love the Sisters of Battle. I love the narrative in my head that's behind it. I loved converting it and building it and doing it. And it made, I'd like to think, hopefully it comes out in the quality. I mean, that's not for me to decide. But what I will say is that regardless of how it performs or has performed at competitions, I'm proud of it and I love it because I was invested through in it throughout. Uh, I think about like Matt DiPietro's Fisherman of Titan that he took... Uh, best in the bust category with last year at Nova. It, that was a tribute to his father, right? And he's, he told the story when he was on Warhammer Weekly. There was emotion in that piece, and you could see it when you looked at it. Um, and so paint something you love. All right. All right, so... Moving on from that, the best miniatures are sort of those that have a level of detail that what I'll say is allow you to sort of show off is the wrong word, but it's kind of that. In other words, that allow you to show a variety of proficiency and provide visual interest. 
This can be wrapped up in things like different textures. So, you know, you're doing some metal and you're doing some cloth and you can have texture in your cloth and you can have flesh and ah, da, 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 right? Um, effectively, you don't want often a miniature that is just a single simple thing. However, that's not always the case. If you do have something very simple, uh, I think of like the Kingdom Death miniatures that are basically just naked people with a lantern, which I've seen people enter into competition. That's fine because one, flesh is very complicated in itself, but two, what then people do with it is they don't just paint it straight and call it a day. They use that to explore things like OSL and, you know, uh, different basing elements that, that bring visual interest to it. So they're using a simple base but building on top of it and still showing that that proficiency, right? The final and simple one is clean cast. Uh, this was a nightmare. This is one of the things, that, so to return back to the Redemption engine on the right, you know, it it's, has the Canonist Viridian strapped on the top who is fine cast, which is an utter nightmare to work with for competition. Like, it, I, I knew she was the only one I wanted because I wanted this image. So there was no other choice because they don't make her in anything but this that terrible fine cast resin. So I had to put in the work to actually, like, putty her up and smooth her out and sand and all this stuff. Like, I had to do a bunch of extra prep work. That's fine. If you want to, like, in general, I would recommend you start from cleaner casts. I think that's one of the reasons you see... A lot of things like Games Workshop miniatures and Kingdom Death miniatures and stuff like that. One, they're aesthetically beautiful and pleasing and have everything I talk about. Like people love them and there's, you know, variety and detail that allows you to show off. But they're also extremely clean miniatures. Um, the casts are generally very sharp and clean and so they're easier to work with. Um, can you do amazing stuff with simple miniatures? Heck yeah. Heck yeah, you can. Even bad casts. Uh, I remember a Gandalf bust that was at ReaperCon, I don't remember who painted it, but Justin McCoy talks about it a lot. There was literally a thing the guy got for 50 cents out of a gumball machine and then just put in the work on. Now, I would recommend that if you're if you're not that person and you're, you know, painting for competition for some of the first times, you're early in your competition career, don't fight the miniature, right? You can you can compensate for this stuff, but don't waste your time fighting the miniature. Just get something that's clean to start with. All right. Preparation. Uh, again, this goes right on from what I was just talking about. Uh, you know, spend time preparing your miniature. More time than you normally would. Clean everything. Look for those flaws, for those mold lines. Get into it. Prime it and then go over it again completely under bright light. Look for inconsistencies and flaws and fix them at the priming stage when you can reprime stuff. Um, think a lot about your miniature before you put paint on it. You don't need to have it planned out exactly. I have certainly, even with competition miniatures, you know, changed my mind midway into, into painting it. Uh, with this girl on the right, that bandana around her throat, I think I repainted that thing three times until I found a color scheme that I liked. Okay. So, but I mean, even though I knew what the, I wanted the rest of it to look like, I just, I could not find the right balance for that thing. And research is your friend. If you're painting a miniature that other people have painted, go look at them. Look on the internet. Look on, look at similar style miniatures on something like Putty and Paint. Get ideas, get inspirations. You don't, you're not looking to copy, obviously. That's not going to do you any good. But it's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with drawing inspiration from other people's work. And from thinking about, oh, maybe I will try some texture too or something like that. That would be a good one. Or this would be a good piece for OSL. Whatever. Do your research. Put in the time. Think about it before you paint it. If you see a flaw you missed at any stage in the process, fix it immediately. That is my advice. Don't wait. Don't come back to it. Stop what you're doing and fix it. If that means you know putting some, some gloss or matte varnish into a crack – and then painting over that and redoing that work, good. Stop yourself and do it right there because otherwise you'll forget. And then you'll go to competition and the judge will find it. This miniature is a wonderful example of that because you can't see it in this photo, but she has a mold line running up her left leg that I can no longer get rid of. Because of the nature of how I did her pants, I can't fix it anymore. So that's just how she is. And every judge I've taken her to, she points out the flaw to me. 
and I know. So if I would have done, and by the way, that's I found I saw it early on, and said I'll fix it later, and then didn't. It's nobody's fault but my own. Okay. Time. The reason I have the bird here is because this is one of the first times I really spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time on a miniature. This this is about a hundred hours on this miniature, and I used micro goals to keep myself motivated. Um, micro goals are a big part of competition painting. You don't, when you set your goal, when we're normally painting, our goal is finish the miniature. If that is your goal, it will be easy to lose interest. Micro goals are, I will finish the wings. I will finish the staff. I will finish the smoke. I will finish his tongue. I will finish his beak. I will finish the, whatever. His nails, the bone, the toenails. I don't care. Just pick whatever you want. I will do the weathering. I will do the chips. Okay. Spend the time. How much time? Spend the time. The time. More time than that. No, more still. More. One of the things you have to do when you're painting for, for competition is build up your endurance. Um... Like I mentioned, that Night Titan was like 150 hours. This bird was 100. You know, I mean, these that's that's a lot of time. <laughs> you know, that's two and a half, three work weeks of effort, right? And it can be difficult to sit there and stare at a miniature for that long and keep working stuff, keep working and keep working and keep working, and and every little detail, accepting only your best possible work on every single detail okay by the way i did i after i spent that time i got feedback and ended up going back and spending another like five hours on him okay so put in the work you will be far better suited at a competition spending a lot more time on one or two miniatures then you will be spending a lot less time on five. Shotgunning the categories or something seems like a great idea, but losing in five categories or something, or having obviously flawed work in five categories, is not as good as having your best work you can do in two. If your goal is to place or win or do well or you know, get a high medal or whatever it happens to be, I don't care. Okay. Then putting in the time is, is your best option. And, it, you know, you, this is a thing you have to build up over time. You can't just sit down. If you're normally just doing army painting and, you know, you look at, like, spending an hour or a couple hours on a fig is a long time, you're not just going to suddenly transition and do, like, a 120-hour figure. <laughs> that's not, that's not going to work. This is a thing you do over time. You, you push yourself, you push yourself to invest more and more, and you build up that endurance muscle, right? Um it's it's like running a marathon. You don't just go from like, you know, taking a jog around your neighborhood to running 26 miles. No, you build up. You run a 5K and you run a 10K, you run a half marathon and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and you intermix in there just some general running. In other words, you intermix in there some general painting to just refine individual skills. Okay. Time is, is key and this is tough. Because this is the mental game. And it's a big part of it. Uh, so just work it up slowly. And and basically you'll eventually come to the point where you can actually see a miniature on your desk for weeks at a time. And sit down, establish a micro goal, finish that micro goal, and feel like you just... You, you did something. You'll get the sense of accomplishment. And you come back the next day with the next micro goal. And the next, 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 and the next... And then you're done. And what you've done is made something quite incredible. All right. Techniques. This is a fun one. First off, there is no required technique for competitive for a competitive miniature, for the most part. I see people ask this question all the time. Is it non-metallic metal required or blah? Enter thing here to win a competition. No. No. Now... I say for the most part because, like, being able to say, 
you know, achieve a relatively smooth blend or, or, you know, achieve the contrast you want or, you know, paint with some level of realism or understand how light works. The sort of fundamental building blocks, if those are to be considered techniques, right? Or having a, a basic understanding of color theory. Okay. Um, yeah, you have to know that stuff, right? Um, but this miniature is a great example. So this is the Marathi I was talking about earlier. You know, I use true metals on her her sort of armor and headdress because I like true metals and I like the way they look on her. I still painted them in a non-metallic metal style using inks and stuff, but it's real metal. Uh, whereas her spear is not. Her spear is, is non-metallic metal. Um, a lot of people will tell you you shouldn't mix those two things on the same miniature. I don't care. I like how it looks, so I mix them. That's how I roll. Um, but the point is, is that, like, it's not about a single technique. It's about creating a cohesive, aesthetically pleasing miniature, right? As long as what you're doing works coherently, then you're okay. Then, then you've used the right techniques. Now, in the same way you don't necessarily need freehand or need texture or need non-metallic metals, but... It does help to show advanced techniques where they are applicable and make sense. If you have cloth or something on the miniature and it's in an appropriate scale where texture would be appropriate, then you should be doing texture. Not because you're just doing texture to do texture, but because it's the correct way it would look. You have shown that you have fundamentally understood the miniature and have been able to create a pleasing and aesthetically correct effect to a high level, right? Uh, don't make a competition miniature your first time doing a particular technique. Um, so, for example, the belly of Marathi there is using the almost like a brush steel Blending, basically, what I what I talked about in my last hobby cheating video in 149, that's effectively using that technique, okay, to create that. Because there's no actual depression. Those are completely flat panels. But I wanted to create this sort of, some sort of, uh, both the idea that they had a sheen to them, but also the idea that they had some depth to them. So I practiced it first, right? I, I did it on some other miniatures first to make sure I liked the way it was going to look, and then I brought it to her. Okay? So, um, generally you don't want the first time you're trying something, especially a brand new technique, uh, to be your competition miniature. You want to have you want to have some confidence with it as you approach it. It doesn't need, mean you need to spend forever mastering it, but again, just not the first time. And that's where we come to comfort versus painting bravely. Uh, in general, you're, I talk about painting bravely. This is, Matt DiPietro famously coined this phrase, something I genuinely believe in. Uh, he is somebody who inspired me with that, and I believe in it 100%. Um, you should paint bravely, and that includes in competition miniatures. So what that means is it shouldn't be your first time. But you shouldn't only try stuff that you've been doing for years and feel like you've 100% mastered. Push yourself. Get out of your comfort zone. All right? But put in the time to do that thing you're doing as best as you can. That's my advice. So you want to be somewhat comfortable, but brave. <laughs> uh, if I were to put it in the, you know, in terms, it's... Sometimes you've got to charge the enemy lines, but don't charge the enemy lines alone. Okay? That's be brave, don't be stupid, I guess. All right, stand out. Uh your miniature this is this is a pretty important one. This is again where we come to like the size of the competition really matters. Your miniature needs to be interesting from a distance. It should stand out in some way and, and catch the eyes of the judge. Um, and I say that because you're going to, especially again, if you're in a very big competition, there could be hundreds of miniatures that those judges have to look at. And 
even if yours is extremely well painted but has nothing eye catching about it, it would be very easy for them to miss you in like a first cut. Most competitions have a sort of first cut where the judges are going to go through and they're going to pick some percentage and say, these are the ones I want to look at more, more closely, right? That's where you need to stand out. That's where you need to catch their eye. So do something unusual, have, you know, have colors that are interesting, techniques that are interesting, things that pop from a distance. And then you need to have more for them to discover once they get close. That's where things like texturing and, you know, very subtle reflections and, and slight color glazes and stuff like that come into effect. You don't see that stuff from three feet away. But with the but if it's there for the judge to discover when they get close, then suddenly you've you've cut yourself again, right? Out from the out from the competition, out from the from everyone else by having something interesting that they found that they discovered when they got close to your piece. Okay. Um, that's I, I there's a balance to that. And it's sort of a thing that you just need to experiment with and play with over time. But my best advice is when you have micro elements that have a chance to become interesting, eyes, uh, you know, gems, right? Re small reflections, small bits of interesting texture, wounds, whatever. Go, go the distance on those so that the judge has a chance to find them when they, when they actually get close to the miniature and are, and are thinking about it. Okay. All right. Winning and losing. So you've done all that stuff. I said, you've done everything. You're ready to go and you go and compete and you get nothing, just a hot nothing. Okay. It's a competition. It's great to win, but you can learn more by losing. I know that sounds like a platitude. I know that sounds silly and hollow and empty. I understand that, but it's true. By losing and getting feedback, you will learn a lot. You will understand directly how you can improve. Okay. And even if you didn't win anything uh, or you didn't achieve the medal you wanted or whatever the case may be in an open system or whatever it is, you still got to show off your work. You got to share with people. You got to engage in the community. That is valuable stuff. And it gave you lessons to hopefully come forward with the next time you show up. Okay. The reason I have this particular miniature over on the right side, which is Cover Girl, which I painted to be uh, a replica of, like, literally, I tried to replicate as close as I could in three dimensional format the original John Blanche cover, one of my favorite pieces of art ever. I mean, I spent just hours staring at that art. Every highlight, every tone, every everything, I tried to make it match. All right. And she never won anything. Like, I entered her in a bunch of competitions. She never won a thing. Okay? And I'll admit that was somewhat heartbreaking for me because she was such a passion project. And I loved her so much. But you know what was awesome? I got to actually show her to John Blanche. And that was one of the coolest things that happened in my life. <laughs> Because he's an artist that always inspired me. Uh, but deeper than that, I had other people say they really enjoyed it. And I realized it doesn't matter, you know, if I'm walking away with a thing. Would I rather be? Sure, of course. Of course. But that stuff, the fact that it, it inspired something or that somebody liked it and liked it enough that they came up and shared that with me. I was so proud of of that and what i had accomplished and i realized i love her just as much regardless because i learned a lot from her it's a tough it's a tough thing man you know i'm not gonna lie like it can hurt to lose or to not do as well as you thought you should have 
but you cannot let that discourage you. Uh, as as Alfred said, why do we fall down, Mr. Wayne? So we can learn to pick ourselves back up again. At the same side, at the same time, if it's a top three competition, do not ever, 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 ever begrudge anyone who won, or, you know, who won over you, or attack judges for their decisions. When you compete in a competition, you are handing over the decision making to the judges and their discretion. Period. That's it. They they have the rights to decide who ranks where. They are the judge. It is not for you to decide. It is for them. That is the agreement, the contract, as it were. You have signed with them by putting your piece in a competition. And don't begrudge somebody who won. It doesn't matter if you think yours was painted better than theirs or whatever. You don't know what the judge saw. You don't know what uh, all that, right? Celebrate. Discuss and share. Celebrate the people who won with them. Talk to the judges, share what you did, share in their success. Because it might be that next year, the situation's flipped. You could be the one sitting up there, and they could be the one who didn't you know, get to that podium or whatever, right? And you don't want them to be cursing you, right, <laughs> under your breath. And I mean, it's not... I'm not trying to, to say it in some sort of karmic fashion or, or anything like that, or you're scared of having them, you know, come at you online or attack you or something. It's not about that. It's just about wouldn't you rather celebrate with them this year so they can celebrate with you next? Wouldn't you rather form that bond? Right? So you will win and you will lose if you compete. And those are both okay. Losing is tough, but if you take the opportunity to learn, to dust yourself off and get back up, it will do more to make you a better painter than winning will do. Feedback. I've mentioned it a hundred times, and we're going to close on this idea of feedback. When you're at a competition, the most valuable thing you can do is get feedback from the judges, direct feedback. Most competitions, the judges will talk to you. They will sit down with you. They will tell you about why they did what they did. Some competitions give you like very real feedback in the form of like score sheets. Those are great. And they'll write sort of notes on them. Um, shout out to, to Gen Con because this is one of the things they do. You get a direct score sheet with your numbers and handwritten notes by the judges. I know it takes them a lot of time and I could never be more grateful. It is – I. I am in awe they do it every year, and it is the most wonderful part of it. I look forward to those pieces of paper so much. Feedback. Seek it out. Welcome it and be open to it. It is very easy to get feedback and go, Psh, poof, Don't do that. Be open to it. Think about it. Think about what they're saying. It doesn't mean that you have to necessarily act on it, right? Notice that's not one of the numbers here, right? Act on it is not one of the... Uh, I hope you liked this. Uh, this is sort of my collected thoughts on it. There's certainly more. There's other stuff when you can... Like if we got into specific competitions, I could give you more specific advice for certain things I've competed in. But I think as a, as a broad general primer, this is everything I would want to share. So if you liked it, give it a like. Uh, subscribe for more hobby cheating in the future. We're going to be returning back to individual techniques next week. Um, share this with anybody. Sharing is always the nicest thing you can do and deeply appreciate it. I do love it when people share stuff. So thank you very much to everybody who does. Uh, but as always, I thank you so much for watching. Get out there and compete. And we'll see you next time.